about what do we mean when we talk about feasibility study. It is not really economic and social only. There is a herd of them others. And for our uh, senior leaders, any time you command a feasibility study or you are given the results of a feasibility study, this will be what we should be looking for. Economic impact and value added feasibility study. You can do a feasibility study and on the face of it, it looks economically viable. Does it have value added for the people or not? Is it worth it to go all the, all the way or the another way? Does it add value to South Sudan? That's of course the primary objective any project for which you want to do a feasibility study has got to add value for South Sudan, otherwise there is no reason to go for it. Will it create better and more conducive atmosphere for investment? And let me share with you a small incident. When I was advising Coleman Young in Bor, an American delegation came to look at Boma. So, Walt asked me to go and just do a quick reconnaissance of Buma, and I came back with fascinating results. A lot of potential. You can put a cement factory there and it will run for 100 years. But how do you take the extractive uh, components out of the area? There are no roads, there is no roadway, whatever have you. So will it create better or more conducive atmosphere? We want to build a hotel is not going to really impact on the population. Uh, to do a housing compound, yes, it will relieve, but it wouldn't have a major impact. And I think that we need, whenever we are thinking of any element of development, we must think of the impact on the population. Cost and benefit feasibility study. If we do the project, will we get out of it more than we have spent on it? That's another area of the studies. Peace and conflict impact assessment. This is a very important tool. It is a tool, it's a tool that has been very well researched. Uh, it started about 15, 17 years back with a very brilliant man who made it. Uh, but now it is, it is universal. If I build a project, am I going to generate unintended negative impacts that will affect either the same community or another community? Are there mitigating measures that we can consider? Are there legacies of conflict we need to consider? Because a conflict that breaks out and it has a lifetime of only 10 days is different from a communal uh, duel that started 20 years, 30 years and went on. It is much deeper and we call this legacy, legacy conflicts. Ecological, climate, and environmental impact assessment. And the three are different, and we need to research the different. What are the internal national uh, factors? What is the unavoidable? Is there anything that we cannot avoid? For instance, if the floods are due to rains, you cannot avoid the rains. The rains are going to fall. If the problem is due to drought, the drought is going to happen. You cannot uh, uh, avoid the drought, but you can mitigate. What are the best practices and lessons learned from other nations? We don't seem really to care much about that. In British Columbia, in Canada, we have floods. There are best practices. The International Joint Commission, which is regulating the Great Lakes, between the United States and Canada has got a wealth of expertise on how to manage uh, waterways. And as we progress a little bit, we might succeed in inviting them to give us a hand. 
how and where will the project have a fallout? For argument's sake, let us take, let us suppose we dredge your clean around Bantio. Then you are putting more water into the river. This water is going to go forward. Is it going to flood another community downstream? Yes or no, it needs to be researched. Women's lens. It is a lens that is always underestimated and I would dare say most of the time it is forgotten. Women are impacted differently from men, especially in communities like ours. And whenever there is a feasibility study, I would advise my brothers, my colleagues, our readers, always ask for and look for and make sure that there is a women lens in any feasibility study done so that we give them their due right. Have the women been consulted? What I call indigenous population, Bernabe corrected me, or I think Brother McWay, to using indigenous. But there are people who have been there for thousands of years. They have got rights. They have got rights by virtue of the fact that they were there for thousands of years. We need to consider their wish when we are doing the study. Political risk impact assessment, and of course, that is the major issue for the government. And that's the unintended impact. Will the dwellers of the suit be agitated or aggrieved? If not properly consulted, would they feel that their government is ignoring them? We just cannot take, regardless what to do in the way of studies, regardless what decisions take, we are dealing with human beings. We have got to respect their dignity and we have got to respect their rights. Who will or will not uh, their support for the government uh, be changed? Will or will not their support? Yeah. If they feel that you are doing something they don't like, they're not going to like you. They're not going to support you. And any government wouldn't want that. And then we need to look into what we call the exogenous and the endogenous. Exogenous is what is coming from our side, NGOs, what consultants, whatever have you. Indigenous is what is the inside. May political alliances possibly shift due to the project? Water security and impact assessment. Will the project reduce or increase the parameters of our water security. Can the principle of right and benefits come into play that South Sudan gains uh, from passing water to other users? Has patterns of climate change? Had the study modeled a trajectory of water security for the next 50, 100 years? You don't plan when you are planning with basic water resources like water, you don't plan for 5, 10, or 15 years. You have to have a very long trajectory. Collateral damage. Example of Western Equatoria. When I went to study the, the Hafir of Louis, and it was later implemented by the GTZ, uh, I found that Western Equatoria is lush, rivers, greenery. The reason is that Western Equatoria falls within the green belt. The green belt is Western Equatoria and Northern Uganda. Why is it like that? We never hear of a drought in Western Equatoria. We never hear of a famine, unless people don't cultivate. The reason is that evaporation from the sud goes up, the northern winds take the moist air and drop the rains in Western Equatoria. You dry the soot, you can kiss the lush plantation in Western Equatoria, goodbye. Will rains in Northern Sudan, ABA, South Darfur be affected? Will Umrawaba series in South Sudan be affected? Yesterday I brought the geological map of Sudan, very large map. Where you have our groundwater, 
underground water is where there is Umrawaba series. Umrawaba series is fed through the water of the sun because it's stagnant water and it seeps through. When I went from Kapoita to Narus, there was a number of boreholes. There is a difference between a borehole and uh, a deep bore. The borehole has a karjaka and give it two, three, four years and you will find that the water has completely disappeared. I found five or six that were just standing there, a piece of junk. Will communities upstream or downstream be affected? Impact on wildlife. Social impact assessment. Will human relations change? Will coexistence be affected? You have got border lines between tribes. Will the delicate tribal unwritten agreements be affected? Will there be migration into the land from hostile communities? Whatever we do is at the end of the day is for human beings. You don't do a project just to wake up in the morning and look at it. Everything is for the welfare of human beings, so they have got to be at the heart of any feasibility study that we do. And then when we are doing the feasibility study, you don't, we don't go like a rhinoceros, just straight to uh, what we want to study. We have got to study different alternatives, and then there are methods, technical, solid methods of evaluating those alternatives. So if a feasibility study is to be brought for approval, approval for any minister or any vice president, I, the first question I would ask, okay, you are recommending this, did you consider other alternatives? Yes, we did. How did you evaluate the alternatives and how did you know that this is the best alternative? That's a critical part of the feasibility studies that people normally ignore. Livelihood impact assessment. South Sudan has the highest per capita in the world of the number of cows per person. It is the highest in the world. And the, and the saying goes when we were young that in South Sudan, people follow cattle, the cattle does not follow people. The reason is that it is the currency. If you want to get married, it is cattle. If one of your boys kills somebody else, the dowry, the uh, compensation is in cattle. So it is the currency of the people. Will the modalities of earning be affected? Will their level of income in cash or kind be affected? Will the stable food be affected because of the change you want to impact? And then when we are doing studies, we have got to identify the people we need to deal with. There is what we call primary stakeholders. The primary stakeholders are those stakeholders who can affect positively or negatively the job that you want to do. If you go against the chief, the chief can tell his people to come and suck you out of the area or probably chop your head off. So we have got to be aware of the area in where we are in. What, is the, what are the powers of the people in that area? Who are the second stakeholders? Who are the beneficiaries from the project? The project? If you get a project and the beneficiaries are 1,000, and you have the same project if you take it elsewhere and the beneficiaries are 10,000, then this is a matter for a new evaluation. Land ownership, which is very sensitive in South Sudan, people can die for it. Any feasibility study has got to get dig very deep in the issue of land ownership. And then impact on what I call the indigenous population. Bernaba did not like that term or uh, Brother McQuay. But what I mean, the people who have been there for a long time. Health and human and animal impact assessment. Any hafir that I surveyed and designed and constructed, one of the main objectives was to care for the veterinary services for the animals and for the dispensaries for the human beings.
species of plants and animals and microorganisms introduced by human action outside their natural habitat. What we call invasive alien species. Invasive alien species are uh, elements that are alien to the area. They could actually destroy the whole ec ecology. So we need to make sure that if we execute a project, we are not int introducing these invasive uh, elements. And I will stop there and thank you very much for listening.